This is the third and the last module of the third training session of the Ultra Wideband Kit from Mobile Knowledge. In this session, we will see how to develop for NXP Trimension SR040 Ultra Wideband chips using the MK Ultra Wideband SDK and the SR040 Ultra Wideband tags included in the kit. So let us recall what we did in the previous modules and what we plan to do now. We defined a scenario in which we wanted to implement an access system with Ultra Wideband. We've implemented a Ultra Wideband lock using the Ultra Wideband Shield 2, and we have extended the PC shell to support the new scenario. When we define the requirements of our new use case, we also said that the SR040 tag, which we used to unlock the Ultra Wideband lock, would blink a green LED when it detected a Ultra Wideband lock within 2 meters, provided it had been granted access to the lock. In this module, we will create a new application using the MK Ultra Wideband SDK, which will run on the Ultra Wideband tag SR040. To do that, we will follow these steps. We will first create a new directory for our new application and name it Ultra Wideband Log Access Tag. We will import it into MCU Expresso and create and configure a new build configuration for it. Then we will add some minimal code so that the SR040 detects Ultra Wideband shields. Finally, we will complete the application with some simple logic to blink a green LED when a lock for which the tag has been granted access to is detected at less than 2 meters. Many of the steps that we will see are very similar to those that we saw when we covered the SR150. SR Start by opening your copy of the MK Ultra Wideband SDK. Open the app folder and create a new folder, which we will call Ultra Wideband Lock Access Stack. Now open it and create an empty text file inside, which we will name tag.c. This time we will not import the project into MCU Expresso because we already did it in the second module of this training session. Instead, we will open the MCU Expresso workspace and import the new folder and the new file into the project. To do that, right-click on the app folder in the Project Explorer, select Import, File System, and navigate to the folder we just created. Click on Select Folder, select it and also select the Create Top Level Folder option and the advanced option to create links relative to the project location. Now the new folder and the new empty file show in the explorer. We'll now create a new build configuration for them. Right click in the project top level icon, select build configurations, manage, and click on new to create a new build configuration. We will call it ultra wideband lock tag SR040. We leave the description field empty and we use the Ultra Wideband tag SR040 configuration as a baseline so that it will copy all the opt options and configurations from this build configuration. Click OK. And we will now remove our new folder from any other build configurations. Right click on it, select Resource Configurations, Exclude from Build, and select all the configurations except Ultra Wideband Lock Tag SR040. When done, switch to the new build configuration by right clicking on the project, select Build Configurations, Set Active, and select the new configuration. We still need to remove the folder Ultra Wideband Lock Anchor from our new build configuration. Right click on it, select Resource Configurations, Exclude from Build. We will take advantage and exclude the folder from all the configurations except the one for the Ultra Wideband Lock Anchor application that we created in the second module of this session.
we still need to add some code so that the project builds. First, though, let's open the file in boards. UltraWide one tag SR040, UltraWide one device.c. This follows a very similar structure to the one that we saw for UltraWide by Shield 2 and SR150. We first find the method mkUltraWideBand app handler. This is where the events from the UltraWideBand library are handled. Events are copied and pushed to a queue that the task in the application layer will later implement. Right after this, we find UltraWideBand device init which runs a series of initializations that are common across many applications that may run on the SR040 UltraWideband tag, and finally calls mktag app init. This is where the application layer should initialize and the function that we will implement right away. Now open tag.c, which is still an empty file. I'll copy some contents on it and we will go through the most significant bits. We first find some includes from the UltraWiban library, followed by the include of the header file tracker and distance.h. We will be using some definitions there, and this is why we are including it. Alternatively, we could copy the definitions to some local file or maybe create a common folder and move the common definitions there. For now though, this will make do. After this, we find the definitions of the access stack, task priority, and the stack size. Right below them, we find the declaration of the manufacturer data. As we saw in the SR150 case, this is a field of the BLE advertising packet that is used in some of the examples in the kit. We will not use it here, but we still need to declare the variables. We leave the length of the manufacturer data as zero and the data proper as a null pointer. Then we find the declaration of the queue, which will hold the events from the UltraWideBand library and the task handle of the task that will run the logic of the access tag. Next is the main task that will run an infinite loop. We will go through it later, but let's first jump to the bottom of the file. Here we find the mktag app init method that we saw that is being called from ultrawideband device.c. This function initializes the ultrawideband library, sets the underlying device type and enables ranging notifications from the library. Then it creates the queue and the task and it returns. Let's go back now to our main task. Before entering the infinite loop, we tell the UltraWiban library to start detecting devices. We want to start UltraWiban as soon as possible after a selectable device has been detected over BLE, so we use BLE and UltraWiban detection type. Also, we only want to detect anchors and we won't be using any whitelist or blacklist policies, so we use policy all as the third argument. If something went wrong, we will call our handler for critical errors, but if everything went well, as we expect, we enter the main loop where we handle the events pushed to the queue. Remember that the events are copies of the original events from the MK UltraWideBand library and that we are using dynamic allocation for it so we need to release the memory to avoid any memory leaks. We will now add a few lines of code to blink a green LED when we detect a valid ultraviolet lock, and we will be done with our access tags. For that, we will create a timer that will toggle the LED when needed. We start by including the file LED.h. And we also add a couple of new definitions. We defined the LED interval as 500 because we want to toggle the LED every 500 milliseconds. We also define the distance that we want the tag to start blinking, which is 200 cm. Now we'll declare the handler for the timer. We also declared a boolean variable that will hold the status of the green LED. We will use this variable to know if we have to turn it off or turn it on. Next, we create a callback for our timer that will launch whenever the timer expires. It 
In the callback, we simply look at the status variable, update the LED accordingly, and update the status variable too. Here, to configure the LEDs, in the tag, we are using the LED utilities from the QN1990 SDK. This piece of code would need to be adapted if any other board or microcontroller was used instead of the QN1990. Now we'll jump to our infinite loop and add some code to handle the ultra wideband events. Basically, if we detect a lock within 2 meters and the timer hasn't started yet, we start it. Or if the distance to the lock is larger than 2 meters and the timer is still running, we stop it. We also make sure that our status variable has the right value before we start the timer and that all the LEDs in the PCB are turned off when the timer is not running. You may have noticed that we always assume that there is only one ultra wideband lock in range. This will simply not work if multiple locks were to be handled at the same time. However, this should be enough for handling one single lock, so we will leave it as is for simplicity. Now, we only need to initialize the timer. We will do that at the end of the mktag-app-init method. We gave the timer a name and an interval in milliseconds. We also want the timer to restart every time it expires, so we use a true here. We will not be passing any arguments to it, so we use null as fourth argument and we finally install the callback for when the timer triggers. When we created the new build configuration, I forgot to exclude the tag folder from the build. If we didn't exclude it, the build would fail because the function mktag app init is also implemented there. So right click on the tag folder, select resource configurations, exclude from build, and select the configuration ultra wideband lock tag sr040. After this, we are ready to build the project. To do that, click on the hammer icon in MCU Expressor. This may take a few minutes, so we will skip forward to the end. So the project built successfully, and we can program the SR040 ultra wideband tags with a new firmware. You should be familiar with how to do that if you went through the second training session of the ultra wideband kit. After this, we will be ready to test the new use case. After that we have programmed our SR040 tags, we can now test our use case. Before we start, we need to connect our Ultra Wideband Shield 2 to the PC, power up the tags with a coin cell, and bring them away from the shield. Open PyCharm if you didn't open it before, and launch the PC shell by clicking on the green arrow. We'll type now the grant access command, followed by the MAC address of one of the two tags. First take the tag we didn't grant access to and bring it close to the shield. Nothing happens and the ultra wideband lock remains locked. Now we take the tag that we granted access to and we bring it closer to the ultra wideband shield. The PC shell reports that the lock unlocked and the tag starts blinking the green LED. 5 seconds later, the ultra wideband lock will lock again and it will unlock again right away as long as the tag is within 2 meters. It seems that everything works well and we have completed the development of the ultra wideband access use case. We have completed the third training session of the MK Ultra Wideband Kit. Let's review what we learned in this session. We have identified the most common software components in an application based on the MKUltra Wideband SDK, and we went through all the various API blocks in the MKUltra Wideband library and given a quick overview of all the methods and APIs, identifying which are provided by the library and which need to be provided by the port or the platform implementation. 
We reviewed as well the platform requirements for porting the MKUltra Wideband Library to other microcontrollers or boards, and we introduced a common use case on which the Ultra Wideband technology may be applied, and used the contents in the MK Ultra Wideband Kit to build it. This is the Ultra Wideband Tag SR040 and the Ultra Wideband Shield 2 as reference hardware platforms, and the MK Ultra Wideband SDK as the software development kit to build the application. Finally, we also extended the PC shell with a new use case, new commands, and new TLBs. Before we close the session, let me share a few words about mobile knowledge and how you can benefit from our expertise in Ultra Wideband. We can assist you in developing customer software and applications around the Ultra Wideband technology. If the MKI Ultra Wideband library fits your needs, we can license it for commercial purposes. We can also support on the design of ultra wideband antennas for your specific products, and also help you porting and integrating the MK Ultra Wideband SDK to other platforms, including bringing up secure ultra wideband ranging between your devices. We can also help you optimize the AOA readings, and in general, you can rely on mobile knowledge for developing the use cases and software that fit your needs. So thank you for watching and see you soon.